And as you see from your notes, if you picked up a set back there by Bill, it's uh, the top 10. So these are what I, can, what I consider the top 10 teachings or whatever of Ecclesiastes. Um, so obviously yours may differ, uh, but that's just fine. We'll just be looking at a few here. So we started exactly four months ago. I mean, we started four months ago on the 9th. So we're almost exactly perfectly four months. Um, so a quick review. The author is Solomon, as far as we know. Uh, we also see we have some recurring themes. I'm going to read uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? Oh, by the way, I forgot to pray this morning. Too. Let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our morning. Thank you, Lord, for a day that we set aside in our country to honor mothers. We thank you for our mothers. We thank you for our wives that are mothers, Lord. Uh, just thank you for the time, effort, energy they put in. And really, they never stop putting it in. And we just thank you for their example. We think about in the Bible, and we talk about um, you know, Timothy's uh, mother and grandmother and the impact that they had on him and the impact that our mothers have on us. I know that without my mother, I probably would not have come to know the Lord, I mean, humanly speaking, um, because of her influence and, and what she did. So thank you so much for mothers, and thank you for this day. Lord, as we look at Ecclesiastes, may your Holy Spirit open our hearts and under understanding that we might grow and learn as we review. And thank you for the time we spent studying this book. All right, so recurring themes. We read through the first three verses there. We see vanity is 38 times, and we see the phrase under the sun is mentioned 29 times, and we went through every one of them during the study. The word vanity means literally emptiness or futility. So I've often said, and it's not original, another speaker said one time, think of it like soap bubbles. You know, They seem to have substance, but actually they don't. They pop and they've gone. So think of emptiness or futility that way. And also the phrase under the sun we could replace with the phrase in human perspective because almost every time it works because mostly Solomon is talking about life from a human perspective primarily. So before we look at my top ten, um, is there anything in this series that stuck out to you? Uh, I don't mean necessarily what I said, but from Ecclesiastes. Anything that anyone learned or that really stuck out in their mind as we went through the four-month process? Can't hear everybody talking at once. <laughs> Julie. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll get there probably today. Anyone else? Bill. Yes. It does. Good. Fear the Lord. Others? Any other things that stuck out to you during the series of Ecclesiastes that maybe, you know, Linda's favorite book? Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Julie, what was that? That's true, right? The birthing parent. Yeah, anyway. Okay, move on. All right, so let's take a look here, and we'll go back in through Ecclesiastes, just bits and pieces here. So first of all, the quest. So chapter 1, I'll read verses 12 to 14. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. Now, do you remember earlier when we first started the series, what was, what was Solomon's background at this point? What kind of things was he engaged in more, off, 
more likely than not. De well, building perhaps, Peggy, for example. Right, idolatry. Uh, when do we think, and we don't know for sure, but when do we think uh, Ecclesiastes was written? Early, middle, or toward the end of his life? Probably the end of his life, yes. And, and I, I kind of agree with what Peggy said. I think that you see Solomon has become jaded over time because he's been participating in idolatry, and it's, it's basically kind of messed up his view of looking at life. And so he starts looking at it from a human perspective, and I think that's part of the reason why we see him being this way. And what Bill mentioned is certainly true. There are times he mentions God, which we'll talk about, and it can be profound and true. And other times he goes off on a tangent where he go, where in the world are you going with this, you know, uh, humanly speaking again. So um, he's probably or possibly backslidden or has been, wives, idolatry. His desire, we see, is to understand our situation under the sun. In other words, what is the meaning or significance to our lives from a human perspective? Now, Solomon was eminently qualified, and why is that true? What was it about Solomon? Go, Julie. He had it all? Okay, busy. Uh, Dan. Yes, he was the wisest man that ever lived, which means, uh, which is a comforting to me, there might be something in Ecclesiastes that's kind of hard to understand, because there's lots of things I have a hard time understanding, but Solomon in his wisdom would have understood it. Go ahead, Peggy. Okay, Lem, go ahead. Why do you have so many wives? Boy, that's a good question, isn't it? It ma makes you wonder. But what, does, what it does tell us, though, is intelligence and wisdom doesn't equal morality. So there's lots of intelligent, wise, wise, humanly speaking, people who make some really stupid decisions because of that sin nature that is always within us. Go ahead, Lamb, again. I have to agree with you. Uh, go ahead, Peggy. Yes. Treaties. Yes, I got you. Bill. Bill. Another thing, too, going along with what Bill is saying is that sometimes there are different periods where we're following the Lord and perhaps, you know, uh, being wise, as it were. In other periods, maybe we're not because we kind of go astray or whatever. So it can actually kind of go back and forth a little bit uh, because of our sin. Um, so he, he uses these words to describe the situation we're facing. He uses grievous, affliction, vanity, striving after the wind. And in the beginning of our series, we talked about what happens when you talk to somebody and they talk about life this way? What do you think about them? They need a medication. <laughs> they need some counseling. You know, you think of them as being a little jaded. It's like, boy, you sure are negative. But because Solomon's so wise, he's not just negative. He's saying this is really the way it is. So that's why we pay close attention to it. Um, so this is the quest. I want to understand the significance of life that we're living, and not so much 
in God's presence as without him. That's kind of like how, how uh, Ecclesiastes is written. In chapter 2, we see the means. Well, how am I going to do that? Now, all of Ecclesiastes is his quest in doing this. But we see in chapter 2, he outlines his program of how he's going to do it. I'll go ahead and read verses uh, 1 through 10. I said to myself, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it's madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely, and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Also, I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself... Notice how many times he talks about himself here. He really, you know, he's really... uh, Yeah. I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was the reward for all my labor. So, What are the ways that man in general seeks to find significance in life, humanly speaking? Achieving things. Okay, let's let's think about maybe work. Okay, what else? Pleasure? What else? What's that? Laughter? That could be go along with, I'll put that with pleasure. Riches, money. Okay, Eric? One-upmanship. Okay, yeah legacy and one more I'm looking for it's very common power okay so you have power pleasure money as we get older comfort becomes more of an issue you know we we focus toward that Um, but definitely these are the things and Solomon says I've done all those things you look in verse one he talks about pleasure part of pleasure he defines in verse three using alcohol So there's alcohol which he uses in order to stimulate his body to to, uh, accentuate pleasure. Verse 8, concubines. In verse 10 it says, anything at all, all my eyes desired, I did not withhold from me. So anything he wanted to do, he did. And he jumped into it with both feet. So he definitely tried pleasure. The next thing we see in your notes there are works. In verses 4 to 6 he built parks, gardens, vineyards, houses, and various structures. Now, when you look at all these things, the parks and the vineyards and the structures, there's kind of a common denominator, well, maybe more than one, but there's at least one common denominator among them all. What would that denominator be? Growing things, what is that? Build them for himself. It was definitely for him. Eric. Growing his net worth. I'm looking for the word time. Because, yeah, because, you know, sometimes when we do something, we're going to test something, we'll test it for a year, or we'll test it for six months to see how it's going to go. Uh, it takes anywhere from four to eight years to develop a vineyard to where you're actually profitable. It takes about as long to develop an extensive garden. So, and, and these projects, he, he took years to build the temple, he took years to build his structure, the armory building um, that he built. So these things weren't something he just tried for six months and went, ah, No, he really invested in these things. He built these things. He used this work, and he saw at the end of it, it's just not, it's just not what I wanted. It's not significant. We see in verse 7, we have slaves, and for your notes, I add the phrase conveniences. Now, back in that day, slaves would be for your convenience, much as we have kids to, no, no, uh, much as we have (laughs) dishwashers, Wash machines, lawnmowers, these are slaves for us. They're mechanical slaves. But these are things that people would have done in the day for you. 
So, so it's like this is their way of getting conveniences so that they can get things done and pursue other things. Um, so Solomon says, I did that. I had all the comfort I could possibly want. In verse 8, it talks about silver and gold, amazing wealth. I computed, oh, um, Hunter, I think that comes up here, doesn't it? Hunter, it's over here, buddy. <laughs> you didn't bring enough for all of us. Um, anyway, uh, I computed one time based on what they said. He, get, he got like $1.5 billion of gold per year. I mean, that, that's it. He just came in 666 talents equates to approximately $1.5 billion worth of gold every year. So he had, he had so much wealth that it was said that silver was regarded as nothing. So in other words, you know, nowadays we look at silver and say, that's kind of cool. But, you know, but now, back then, yeah. Gold. It's just silver. So, not mentioned but implied is power. He was the king after all. So, Solomon truly did have it all. He had everything. Go ahead, Steve. Sure. Oh, good. Self deception. <laughs> Interesting. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. The way I look at that phraseology is, in other words, he, was, he had clarity of thought to record what he did. That's how I look at the wisdom thing. Obviously, he was doing stupid stuff, and he says it was foolishness, but I, I, I feel like, but yet my wisdom was there to the extent of which he could write about it. So that's kind of how I'm looking at the wisdom thing. Julie. Right. 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 And like Steve said, that's why when you take God out of the equation, it really does seem like it's worthless and meaningless and, and nothing but heartache, which, which it is without God, essentially. Um, verse 12, I, I find very significant, too, of chapter 2. It says, um, So I turn to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? And what I, what I did is I looked at that verse, and I, I, what I take that to mean is Solomon is telling us that his experience is definitive. In other words, we could, we're free to do any one of these things ourselves. We could try the power thing. We could try the, you know, the money thing. We could try all these things ourselves. But Solomon says, I've already done that, and it, it's ruined. Now, you can do it yourself, or Solomon says, you can go ahead and take my example and save yourself a whole lot of grief. That's how I take that, by meaning it's definitive. It's, it's completely trustworthy, what Solomon is telling us here. We then take a look at what I call the threat, which is chapter 2, verse 18. At least, at least this is what he considered it. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor, for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor, for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This, too, is vanity. So this is another aspect of futility in human existence, and that is to say, who is going to take over where you left off? Who is going to, to carry it on? Who will inherit it? Why does that bother Solomon? What does he care? He's going to be dead and gone. What difference does it make who, who follows him? His pride? True, good. What else? Peggy. Sure. Okay. 
Aaron. Okay, Peggy. Oh, you're so you're so right. That's so right. Um, one thing, one thing that is kind of the undercurrent that you see, and you see it kind of clearly here. Solomon wants things that last. He's looking for things that make a difference and last. I mentioned Viktor Frankl's book, *Man's Search for Meaning*. He was a—he uh, uh, was part of a—he was in a concentration camp. He was a Jewish psychiatrist who lived, and he did a lot of—he did a lot of writing about what it meant to be a concentration camp person. Um, and he mentioned that all of us have a sense to where we want something of significance. We want to contribute something of significance. We want something that lasts. And that's kind of what you see with Solomon. He wants this to last. Is it going to last? No, it isn't. Who winds up being his successor? Do you remember? Rehoboam. Now, is Rehoboam a smart guy or a not so smart guy? A little less than smart. Go ahead, Bill. Or Julie. I think a lot of times thinking that he would reach out to Alfred even before, mm-hmm. but it's the Lord is somebody who uses that to really achieve what God wants to do. And we know that about him because he goes on and on and on. That's true. The things that really matter, maybe we don't even see a lot of the times. Excellent. Um, even as Christians, this can kind of affect us a little bit. I was having a conversation with a relative just yesterday who is a pastor, and uh, he talks about retiring because I was, I was waxing eloquent on the benefits of retirement, you know. He's been in the pastor for 42 years, and uh, it's my brother-in-law, and uh, he talks about, well, it has to be God's will. No, <laughs> it has to be, the Lord enters into that, and it's God's will. But, but one thing he did mention that kind of really clicked with me, well, who's going to take over, you know, for me? He, he doesn't have anyone, clearly. So even us as Christians, and he, that's a good reason, you know, to be concerned, is we want what we've done to last to make a difference, and it's going to make a difference if it's done for, for the Lord. Um, it can bother us. We want something to outlast ourselves. We turn to chapter 3 where we see what I call the timing. Um, you know, the birds uh, turn, 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 the song from the 60s, 50s and 60s. Most of us have heard of it. And this is where that song comes from. It talks about there is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but verse 2 says, A time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. So verse 3, at least the first part's bookends of the whole thing. A time to be born and a time to die, and everything else kind of falls into place. Um, Now, most patterns that you see in verses 3 to 8 must be followed or all or very nearly so. Now, some of those things you see there can be delayed or maybe even neglected, but many you can't. For example, a time to plant and a time to harvest. You better pay attention because that's your livelihood back at that day. Uh, There are other things that are are, uh, mentioned that you can alter, but many you can't. Um, So when he mentions that there uh, there is this appointed time, what is the inference there? Can't do much about it. That'd be one. You're going to have a set amount of time. And also, if you have somebody making appointments, you have somebody making appointments, right? There is the appointer. There is God who is in charge, who is in control. Um, 
It says, what profit, in verse 9, it says, what profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? Um, what profit? The word profit there means literally what remains behind. It's not just like when you've done your job, you've paid your bills, you have 100 bucks worth of savings left over, maybe. Uh, but rather it's a value. What value is there left over because of what I've done? What profit is there? Um, does that give us encouragement or discouragement? Look at those verses 2 to 8. What would you say? Is that an encouraging section, discouraging, or... What would you think, looking at yourself? Julie? Okay. All right. Okay, so by giving you a warning can be a positive thing. Okay, good. What else? Positive or negative and why? Actually, it could be either, I think. It kind of depends on your, your, uh, your bent. If you're, a, if you're an optimist, you could look at this and see the positive things. If you're a pessimist, you can look at that and say the negative things about it. Uh, but these are things that are real, and they're going to make, make a difference. Um, I, had a, I had an officer I worked for in the fire department early in my career, and he, he was really quite well, he was a control freak is what he was. <laughs> so he wanted to control everything, which meant me sometimes. He tried. Anyway, um, so... It would drive him nuts when he'd come into work and he'd look at the schedule and he has a drill scheduled for him that he has to do. He didn't want to do that. He wants to control this or that. I said, what do you care? Now you know what you're going to do today. You know, I mean, I, I looked at it completely opposite. I don't have to worry about what to do because it's already been given to me. For him, it's like, I want to control this or that. So there again, what's your personality? What is your bent? Those verses might have that kind of an impact upon you. And then we see an enlightenment. So what Bill mentioned earlier, when God is mentioned by Solomon, it makes a difference. He, he speaks profoundly. So in, in chapter, um, chapter 3, verse 11, it says, He, meaning God, has made everything appropriate in its time. He's also set eternity in their hearts, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor, it is the gift of God. So he says this five or six different times in Ecclesiastes. The reason I say five or six is because he, one of them he says it a little bit differently, but he's saying more or less the same thing. Um, rejoice, do good, enjoy life and the fruit of your labor. To do so is to receive the gift that God gives to you. You know, for some of us, we need to be reminded, stop, rejoice, enjoy what you're doing, enjoy life. This is what God's made for you. He doesn't mean for us to work six, seven days a week. I, you know, they're again touching on the Sabbath idea again. And he has to remind us, come on, sit back, enjoy life, because it's made for our enjoyment. And it makes a difference for us. You know, people who don't take a Sabbath, who don't take time off, it has... It has an effect on them. It has an effect on their um, psychology. So this is enlightenment. It's mentioned five or six times. Relax. Enjoy life. Go ahead, Julie. Really? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All the boat stuff. Well, here's something else, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent, which, you know, I never do. Um, church. Have you ever, now, this church does pretty good. I Don't misunderstand me. But other churches I've been to, right, uh, boy, we got this thing going on. And boy, boy, Lou, what are you doing on Thursday night? Uh, I have a family to raise, but, but do you have time to do, you know, come on, Craig, what are you doing on Saturday evening, you know? This kind of thing, where you get quite a bit of pressure uh, to, to give and to contribute. Um, consequently, what can happen to you? Need a vacation, true. How would that affect you? Well, you know, I, like I said, we're pretty balanced here. We do let you know when there's needs and stuff, but there's no real pressure. 
But I've been to churches that do, really do put pressure on you. And, and how much time do you contribute to church and why? And Eric, I noticed you weren't there on the work day on Tuesday. And, you know, I just was wondering where you were, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, I mean, maybe a little of that's okay. But, I mean, even at church we can be overcommitted. Even at church we can do too much. So we need to be mindful of priorities. You know, what is really important and have those priorities, okay? Every need is not your need. One pastor was preaching that one time at church, and I, I thought that was profound. You know, you hear of a need, it doesn't mean it's your need. You know, maybe this one isn't your need. Now, something will be, but maybe it's not yours. Um, some years ago, I was teaching at a church, and the pastor asked me, Jeff, would you mind becoming the head of the Sunday school thing? Sure, why not? Okay, I'll do that. <clears throat> what a disaster. Six months later, I was pulling my hair out, and I went up to him and said, I've got to humble myself. I'm not meant to do this. this. I love teaching, I teach, et cetera, but all this other stuff, I'm terrible at it. I can't do it anymore, you know. It was, I hated doing that. But what happened was the following week, the person who probably should have done it in the first place stepped forward and took over and did a wonderful job. Okay. My point is, not every need is your need. So between you and the Lord, assess, do you, do you have a desire to do those things that are open? If so, you know, with the Lord's uh, permission, do them. But at the same time, just be mindful. Don't allow church any more than your job or something else to completely take over all of your spare time. Oppression. In chapter 4, we look at oppression. We see actually several different kinds of oppression. In verse 1, we see uh, oppression. Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression, which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no power or no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So we're looking at oppression by government, essentially. Whoever is oppressing has the power and can oppress. What are some ways the government can be oppressive to you and to me? <laughs> taxes. No, it's the first thing I thought of, too. Peggy, go ahead. Taxes. taxes. Okay, well, I got the taxes thing nailed down. What else? Freedom of speech? Yes, yeah, something that we're looking at right now. What else? How else can the government be oppressive to you? Freedom of religion? Peggy? For example... Okay. Okay. Great. For example. Right? Thou shalt wear a mask, but it's cloth. It does no good. Ah, oh, you're questioning me. What's wrong with you? I have the power. I will, I will kick you out of your business. You're going to meet in your church. It'll cost you $1,000 a week. You know, uh, that's oppressive. Now, I will say this, sometimes there's a need for that because we do have the sin nature and sometimes we do sinful things and the government is primarily for the protection of everybody else. But of course, what's the limit? Oppressive, oppression by government. In verse 4, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after the wind. So there we see kind of oppression between individuals. Now this isn't, you're, you're not actively oppressing somebody, but, but how are you kind of allowing yourself to be oppressed there? Keeping up with the Joneses or the Cohens, whatever it would have been back in that day, right? Uh, there is a tendency to look at your neighbor, to covet what they have, and to go ahead. And, and we see this in advertisements frequently. I, I see sometimes an advertisement, and, you know, the guy's sitting there, he's doing his lawn, and his neighbor pulls up in the brand-new BMW, right? Oh, wow, wow, Rick, you know. Well, they're down there, and they got this great deal going on, and you feel this component. Well, I should have a BMW, too, because I'm just as good as, as Bob over here, right? You know, so you, you get that rivalry, which can be oppressive. And I've mentioned before the phrase, uh, we, use, we use money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't even like. How often is that true, right? We charge things uh, because we're going to impress somebody that is not even a really good friend, but 
well, I want a BMW too, right? Or whatever the situation may be. In verse 8, we see slightly different kind of oppression. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, And for whom am I labor, depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity and is a grievous, grievous task. So I kind of call this internal oppression. This person is kind of oppressing himself. He's not working from a sense of need or just to provide for him and his family. Uh, he's working from the sense of more. And either he doesn't have anyone to help him, or he's driven off the people that have been helping him because of his personality and his habits, etc. So he is by himself, he's working himself to death for no real good reason. That's, that's the kind of oppression we're looking at there. <clears throat> we see senses of futility in chapter 5. <clears throat> There's a couple of different kinds of futility there. In verse 10, it says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? This tags right in with the last person that we had who's just working himself to death because he is, you know. So um, we see that money is futility. Possession of it makes one want more. And again, we've talked in the past about that God-shaped hole in our heart that only he can fill, even though we try to fill it with all sorts of other stuff. I was going to use the phrase gold fever. Has anyone heard the phrase gold fever? What are you laughing at, Al? <laughs> yeah, you hear about it a lot, don't you? Now, gold fever is real. I'll tell you that right now. And, and what it is, it, it makes you forget everything else. Let me give you an example. I was dredging one day, and I had an amazing day. It was, it was the best day I'd ever had. And pretty soon I'm thinking man, I'm really hungry. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't stop. There's no way. I, I could see that gold stuff, and I kept going. It's, now, it's, it's covetousness, it's greed, it's whatever word you want to use. But yeah, it, it's a motivation for more, 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 and you're never really satisfied. And there again, when we have a lot of money, things increase which consume them. And Bill mentioned earlier taxes. What happens when you make more money? Is that fair? They take more because you make more? It's not even, ah, come on. So they, they take more. Plus, there's another way that when you have a lot of stuff, it takes from you. How does it do that? Julie? Okay, well, that could be something. Craig? Oh, isn't that the truth, right? I mean, it takes time. you got to do the oil changes. you got to replace the chimney. My daughter contacted Linda yesterday. They have to buy a new, H, what is it, a, um, a heat pump, you know, out of the blue. And they're homeowners. Ah, you know. So <laughs> it costs money to maintain this stuff that you have. So it kind of owns you while you own it. Things, things increase to take from them. What's that? Yeah, if you're a maintenance guy, right, you know. I'm not such a maintenance guy, though. Go ahead, Dean. Oh, that's true. If you've got a lot of money, you can hire Bill to come and repair it for you. Nice. I like this. Ah. But he's... It's not because his roof leaks, though, right? <laughs> he, had, he had the maintenance guy fix his roof. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's very true. Um, in chapter 6, um, verses 1 to 3, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, so it's another act of futility here, and is prevalent among men, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This too is, this is vanity and severe affliction. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many that may be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. 
So in this case, the futility is um, that this person has everything necessary for a bountiful life. He has riches, he has food, he has everything, and yet he, he can't enjoy them. Um, what stops him from enjoying them? We, we mentioned one of the things that could stop you from enjoying them is an early death. Obviously, that would prevent you from enjoying these things. Um, other things that could prevent you from enjoying them uh, could, be, could be illness. Uh, there could be something happening to you that you have all this stuff, and yet you can't do anything with it. And that is futility. It's unexpectedly futile. In verse 12 of chapter 6, it says, For who knows what is good to a, for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? He'll spend them under a shadow, or like a shadow, for who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? So once again, Solomon touches on that uh, category, no one knows what will follow. We have no way of knowing. Um, everything good can be undone in successive generations. Uh, we've seen some, some good that was undone a few months ago. It's still ongoing. Look at the kings in the Old Testament. I mean, especially the kings of Israel and then Judah. Um, you see, you have a good king, things go well, and then all of a sudden you'll have a bad king and things just collapse. You know, up and down, up and down, because... That's the way it is. I mean, um, no one knows, humanly speaking, what's going to follow. In chapter 8, we looked at rulers for a little bit. Um, verse 1, Who is like the wise man, and who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. I say, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him, do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? For good reason, in verses 1 through 4, obey rulers. In Solomon's time, a ruler had absolute authority. If the ruler said, you're dead, you're dead. And he had people waiting right there with swords to make sure it happens uh, right away. Nowadays, it's a little bit different. I mean, we have a republic. Um, so to not obey may not mean death, but we've already seen and we, we alluded to the fact that there is, the government still has a lot of power and can still put a lot of pressure, bring pressure to bear upon us. We could lose our freedom. We could lose our finances. We could lose our businesses, um, lose our homes. The government, even as a republic, still has a lot of power. Therefore, we need to use wisdom to know what to obey and what not to obey. When is it okay to disobey a government? When it violates God's laws? Peggy? Okay. Give me an example of, of that. An example where God's laws are, I mean, yeah, God's laws are being assaulted by government, and you have to make a decision. Bill? Bill? Okay, don't meet together as a congregation, which we were seeing, right, for a while. Eric. <laughs> it's disinformation, which I think is an appropriate name for it. Julie. Okay. The vaccine thing, good. Good, good. Other ideas, thoughts? What they're teaching in school? Yeah, right. Hold your place here and turn to Acts chapter 5 just for a second. We'll, we'll see what I consider to be the, the classic example. And by the way, as I've mentioned before, I, I can't say enough good about Pastor Jason and Pastor Justin for their, their desire to open up as soon as possible, and they did. And, you know, they went through all sorts of hoops, all sorts of anguish, you know, rigmarole to open up as early as possible, and we owe them a great deal of, of uh, credit for that. Some of my kids were, they couldn't go to church at all, even after we'd been going for quite some time, so it's pretty cool that, that Pastor Jason had, and Pastor Justin had that vision. Uh, so Acts chapter 5 and verse 30, or 27, this is where uh, Peter and John have been called in to the, um, to the Sanhedrin because they've been preaching about Jesus again. When they, the, the people, the high priest, had brought them in, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, 
we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in his name. And yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, Well, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. <laughs> wow. You know? So this is a clear cut case of obeying God or obeying man. It, it can't be muddled. It's very clear. And not only, not only do they choose to go ahead and obey God rather than, they go ahead and preach the gospel in a very offensive way. Whom you crucified. Did I mention you did it? The Holy Spirit came upon us. You don't have the Holy Spirit, do you? That kind of thing, right? Very, very volatile. Go ahead, Steve. That's true. And often what happens is they'll do something and it causes you grief and difficulty and then you, you can take it to a court, hopefully, and get it resolved. But no matter what, it is, it's still terrible for those few months or years while it goes on, right? To me, the biggest thing about choosing to obey or disobey the government is to be very clear in your own mind, to know specifically why you are correct in this. Because there's been lots of people who have chosen to disobey the government and they were flat wrong and it didn't work out well for them. Um, the, uh, the, the pro, the pro, this, um, Jim, Jim Brown? Yeah, back in the 1850s, he, um, he was a person who was trying to get, uh, set the slaves free. Well, he disobeyed the government, he raided the armory, the Springfield Armory, he tried to take over by force, by causing war, well, that's not right, you know, he, 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 but in his conscience, I'm sure he was right. So there again, if you're going to disobey the government, you better be right, okay? Don't take it loosely. You better be right because if you're wrong, not only will you get, you know, get punishment, you won't get blessing from God in it. Bill. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's doing two wrongs, right? I mean, that's being wrong to bomb the clinics. Yeah, exactly. So there again, know what you're doing before you take that risk because it's a really big deal. Peter and, Peter and uh, John, yeah, they, they, they knew exactly what they were doing and they were right where they needed to be. Chapter 9, flip over there. Of, of back to Ecclesiastes, chapter 9. I'm thinking, boy, this has a lot of chapters all of a sudden because I'm in Acts. Chapter 9, we see that again that God is sovereign. In chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, For I have taken all this to my heart and explained it, that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. And then uh, down to verse 11, um, 
I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, and the battle is not to the warriors, and neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. So there again, we have no guarantees in life. Time and chance overtake us all. We all have our cars break down. We all have things that happen. We all have health issues. Uh, you know, God, that's the way life is for us. Um, so we don't have any guarantees. Um, it's interesting, sometimes when difficulties hit, we, we think that it's unfair because we're living for the Lord. I'm living for the Lord. Things should, things should be better for me, right? I mean, I remember thinking that way many, many years ago. Uh, now I realize that <laughs> sometimes if you're living for the Lord, that's why things are messed up for you, you know, humanly speaking. Among other things, God's disciplining me. He's, he's sanctifying me. Um, and other times, uh, people hate your guts because you're living for the Lord, and they make it difficult for you. So God's in charge. He calls the shots. And this should be comforting to us because if we belong to him, he loves us and he seeks our highest good. And that's another thing that's easy to forget. I, one of my daughters, Angela, recommended a book to me, which I'm reading, and I believe the title is Humble and Meek. And it's about Jesus primarily. It's about his character and who he is. And the whole book is about not only Jesus, but about God and what God is really about. And even though I've been studying this stuff all my life, essentially, I'm looking at that and I'm going, wow, that's just a different way of looking at things to where you see God, I, I don't know your, your vision of God, but some people have a vision of God that he's there ready to jump on you or, or whatever, but to see God as, I want to forgive you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to be a part of your life. You know, I, I want your highest good. Now there again, it's not like he's going to make everything great for us Thing, bad things are going to happen, but he wants a part of our lives. He wants us to be in fellowship and communion with him, and then he uses these difficult times in order to make us more like him. Ju Julie. I think that people <clears throat> Yeah, I know. I'm glad we didn't eat from that fruit of life. Right. Exactly right. It is. Very good. Thank you. Um, and also, Jesus promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. So he's always with us in our suffering, in our hard times, and he cares for us. And last of all, number 10 is remember God, which we talked about last week. Chapter 12, verse 1. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come, and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. And then flip over to the end of the chapter. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether good or evil. Linda and I and Linda's mom went up to my one of my daughter's houses uh, in Monroe a few days ago. And her daughter, one of her daughters turned 13. Now, when they turn 13, uh, what my daughter has done is she calls us together and she encourages us to speak into their lives at 13, which is so cool. And so, so this is Kaylee. She's the second one we've done this with. And this is actually what I spoke into her life. I said, remember the Lord in the time of your youth. That's today. Right now, you're there. This is the time of your youth. Remember the Lord. And I said, now, remember doesn't just mean remember like, oh, yeah. It's remember with the idea of obeying, to listen, you know. Yeah, Dad, I remember you said mow the lawn. Why didn't you? Well, I, I just remembered. No, I said to do it, right? Remember the Lord. And, and also, I mentioned to her the fact that, you know, if you do this, you're still going to have hard times, but you won't have so many hard times that are self-induced that people get because of sin. You, you won't have those, but you'll have your own hard times, but they won't be self-induced, which is a positive thing. Um, and the way to do that I, it's Romans 12, 1 and 2 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and perfect will of God 
presenting a living sacrifice. It's acceptable, it's reasonable, and if we know him, we owe him everything. And why not give him everything? That's all we can do, that's all we have. Give him everything. He continuously seeks our highest good. Any final thoughts before I continue going over time? Thanks, everybody. So next week we're going to start with Bible doctrines. We're going to probably hit on the inspiration of Scripture first. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So thank you so much, Lord, for our day. Thank you that we can take a look at your word. Thank you for Ecclesiastes, for the things that we've learned, that we're reminded of, that we're challenged with. I pray, Lord, that we would, all your word, may just be like, uh, be like threads of gold in our lives, Father. Lord, be with us in the next service. Be with Pastor Jason as he preaches your word. Be with the worship team as they make that joyful noise. And may we lift you up, Lord, uh, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.